Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to Unmasked Virtual Town Hall Series. My name is Abba Blankson. I'm the Chief Marketing Communications Officer for the NAACP. We are very excited about the experts and leaders we have for tonight's panel on the coronavirus vaccines and treatments and options, as well as our partnership with the Ad Council, and of course, our media partner, BET. We look forward to an informative and engaging conversation tonight. If you want to support the work of the NAACP, go to naacp.org to stay connected. For our phone participants, if at any time you have a question, please dial star three. If you're watching on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, um, or Twitter, you can leave us a question um, at NAACP. With that, I'd like to introduce NAACP President and CEO, Derek Johnson. President Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alba, and welcome to everyone this evening for joining the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. And ironically, this is the 11th month since we started our first Teleton Hall meeting. Uh, once we realized that COVID was having a, a devastating impact on our community. And tonight's conversation will be something that I hope will serve as information for many of you as we continue to navigate in this moment. In AACP, we are excited to partner with the Ad Council as they launch their national campaign to educate millions of Americans around COVID-19 and the options that we have. We're also proud to announce tonight's moderator. She is known by many as a TV personality. I can recall the many times that I look to her for information. Uh, tonight, Deborah Roberts will navigate the conversation of this expert panel that will come before us. So members of the NAACP, friends and others, please welcome Deborah Roberts. President Johnson, thank you so much and nice to see you and I'm delighted to be here. And hello to all of you out there and thank you for joining us for this discussion that I feel is so important uh, and really just that kind of captures a conversation that I think so many of us are having wherever you are or wherever you go, if you're even going anywhere these days. And that is the coronavirus and of course lately the vaccine. Uh, there are three that have surfaced right now, two that have been approved, one is waiting approval, and there are a lot of questions swirling. So many of us are just really either confused or just looking for clarity. Uh, questions are rising. Uh, what are these vaccines all about? How are they different? Should I take the vaccine? If you're like me, you may have some people in your family who have actually been vaccinated. You may have others who have not been and others who might be a little skeptical. So what's the real truth on that? Well, tonight we are gonna to try to help clarify and help you make some of those decisions and get to um, some actual, you know, understanding of what's happening and kind of get a better feeling of where we're going in this country. Because every day we keep hearing news about the vaccines and going forward. So to help answer these questions tonight, we have um, an esteemed panel of um, experts and doctors. So let's get right to it, shall we? Um, first of all, joining us, Dr. Reed Tuxen a leader in the field of medicine. He is a former commissioner of public health for DC, president of Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science. He holds a leadership position at the NIH and the National Academy of Medicine. And most important for this discussion, he is the founder or one of the founders of the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, among other positions that he holds. So welcome to you. Also with us, Dr. Chris Purnell, a leading voice in preventive medicine and public health as a community advocate promoting equality in healthcare. She has also served on a New Jersey civilian task force as a medical expert and currently works in a hospital executive role promoting strategies for health equity and inclusion. Also with us tonight is Dr. Cameron Webb, a physician and lawyer who works passionately to promote health and social justice in underserved and marginalized communities. He has worked in both the Obama and Trump administrations and is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia School of, Med of Medicine and still practices clinically and is a member of the Biden administration's COVID-19 response team. I'm exhausted hearing about all of the accomplishments of all of you. And of course, uh, we have President Johnson here with us too. So welcome to all of you. Good to see you. Well, I'm going to start with you, um, Dr. Webb. I'll begin with you, and I'm going to ask you a question that I really would like all of the panel um, members to address. And I'll start with you first. 
Um, because the president today came out and many of us noted that he uh, announced a major milestone that 50 million Americans have been vaccinated um, against the coronavirus. He still wants to get to 50 million more over the next uh, month and a half, couple of months, I guess, but he cautioned that there's a lot of work to do. So let me ask you first, uh, Dr. Webb, and then the others of you can um, answer as well. What's your biggest concern at this moment about defeating the virus? Well, first off, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here with you all this evening. And I'll sum it up in one word, equity. And, and I say that uh, for a few reasons. So in the Biden administration, uh, my role is a senior policy advisor for equity on the White House COVID response team. And so my work is solely focused on this idea of ensuring that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you have a fair opportunity to make it through this pandemic uh, well. And I think that's our focus. And with this uh, vaccine rollout, a lot of people have focused on the idea of speed. Uh, even the, the president has, has acknowledged 100 million uh, shots in 100 days was a big goal. But what we say all the time is that that goal doesn't do much for us without equity. We don't stop this pandemic. We don't crush this pandemic without equity. And that's making sure that the communities that are at the highest risk and the hardest hit have a chance uh, to get this vaccine that not only can save lives, but it also can prevent severe illness. So, so that's what we're focused on. That's the work that we're doing every single day. That's the work that President Biden is very focused on, Vice President Harris is very focused on, and, and that I'm grateful to be able to collaborate with so many folks across the country on. I think uh, states all over uh, the country recognize how, how key and critical equity is in this work. Dr. Tuxin, your thoughts? I think that we are in a terribly important race to the finish line here. Uh, we really do have a challenge about whether or not we will get enough people vaccinated in time uh, for, the, uh, for the vaccines to be able to work and, and not have the mutations take over. So this is a really, really critical moment where we have to move as rapidly as possible to get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we get to the herd immunity that we need before the, va the uh, mutations occur. And the other thing that I worry the most about is whether or not in this particular moment, people will get lazy and stop wearing their masks, stop doing physical distancing, stop uh, not being indoors in places that they shouldn't be, not letting people in their homes who do not live with them. This is the moment to double down. And if we do not, if we do not, I am terribly afraid uh, that the, the variants will take over and we'll be back in deep trouble once again. And I want to talk about all of those issues, too, the variants and the masks. But Dr. Purnell, your thoughts, too, right now, your biggest concerns? Definitely. Since we've already discussed vigilance and we've discussed equity and access, I'm going to say cultural humility and empathy, because in order for us to be able to achieve equitable outcomes around vaccination, equitable outcomes around preventing additional um, disability and death, we're gonna to have to be able to understand where people are coming from. And we need to speak in cultural and socially fluent terms. That starts with acknowledging histories, that starts with acknowledging present day disparities, and that starts with acknowledging humanity. So we can't lose sight of that, especially as people are growing fatigued. Right, and that, and that is definitely starting to happen because we're one year now into this. Dr. Webb, let's talk about uh, these um, different vaccinations now. Uh, we know that Johnson & Johnson is about to come on um, board. Well, maybe it'll be approved. We hear in the next week or so. Maybe you can update us on that. We know that there are two vaccines already out there, the Pfizer and the Moderna. It's almost for a lot of people. I mean, of course, we know that a number of people have been vaccinated, but a lot of people are sort of concerned. It's almost like they're trying to buy a new car, right? They're trying to figure out what's best for me. How do I do this? And give us a breakdown, if you would, about the differences between these um, different vaccines and also what your thinking is about the Johnson & Johnson one uh, shot required as opposed to the others which require two. Yeah, well, there's a lot packed into that question. And so uh, I'll start <laughs> off by saying this. We have, we have two uh, vaccines that have an emergency use authorization so far. That's the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Um, both of them uh, are very effective. You know, Pfizer 95% effective and, and Moderna 94% effective. And the first thing you should ask is effective at what? It's, it, they're effective at preventing death and severe illness, requiring hospitalization. That is our greatest goal in this work. And if you think about what has guided uh, kind of a lot of the efforts all over the country, it's been this idea of preventing death and severe illness. And that has where we've, that's where we've seen the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities. 
And so that's one of the big things here is that both of those vaccines do really uh, a really good job at that. And so, you know, of course, uh, it's tomorrow, the, the Johnson Johnson vaccines going up before the FDA. And I think they're going to make their, their determination. There will be some additional conversations beyond it. But from the early numbers, what we've seen, what's been released thus far, is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as a single dose is very good at preventing death. It's very good at preventing severe illness. In fact, in the 28 days that they were following folks, there were no deaths in, in, or hospitalizations. So that's really important data for us to know about that vaccine. It does exactly what we want it to do. So yes, there are slight differences. The Pfizer and Moderna, they are both mRNA vaccines or messenger RNA vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson is an adenovirus uh, viral vector vaccine. So it's a different vehicle, but it has the same goal prevent death, prevent severe illness. 66% effective compared to the others. Does that, should that concern people? Again, I think that you wanna focus on what the goal of these vaccines is. And so remember, um, that number that you're hearing is just about folks having any amount of symptomatic illness. But if our goal is to prevent people from dying and prevent people from having severe illness, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does that extremely well. And so, and, and keep in mind, when we have the flu shot every year, for instance, you know, that, that's far less uh, effective than these, uh, has lower efficacy rates than what we're seeing with these vaccines. So that 66% is an effective vaccine. But beyond that, it's about preventing death. It's about keeping people alive and keeping people out of the hospital, keeping people healthy. And again, from what I've seen so far, and again, the FDA is going to be discussing this and of course the different committees, but the early number seen, I think I remember having a conversation about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is because it does keep people from dying, which is really important. Dr. Purnell, a lot of people, we've talked about the fact that, it, you know, disproportionately in communities of color, of course, we've been impacted, but also disproportionately communities of color have some reservations sometimes. So give us your thoughts about, uh, or people out there, if you would explain to them about these vaccines. Some people would say to you, well, they rushed to make these vaccines. Um, you know, they came about in the last year. Uh, how can we feel that they're really safe if they were <sighs> manufactured so quickly? Look, we've got to speak to people in very plain spoken terms, right? Um, skepticism is at an all time high in regards to our public institutions. And that's because this process has been and had been, I should say, overtly politicized. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to meet people where they are. And we need to break down the science and break down the facts and do it in ways that people can digest and understand the information. Yes, this looks like it moved very quickly. But what people may not understand is, especially with the messenger RNA vaccines, we're talking about a different science. We're talking about a different technology. The science in and of itself moves quicker with the messenger RNA vaccines. And it wasn't just discovered. So we were building, we in the scientific community, we're building upon decades worth of research, especially critical breakthroughs in the last decade. And we need to help people understand that, understand that what was different about the process was not because corners were cut, was not because anything unethical happened. And also we have to be able to diffuse um, the collective trauma that historical injustices have caused, especially in black and brown communities. We're talking about communities that have been saddled with medical experimentation and exploitation and even present day disparities when we speak the names like Dr. Susan Moore. So if we speak that truth and we speak that truth in a very empathetic way in a way that emphasizes humility, I think people will begin to understand just what the choice they're facing. Dr. Tuxton, um, we, um, we've all heard that um, minority communities are not getting access to the vaccine uh, as quickly as other communities. And it's, it's sort of interesting because when you hear people talk about it, at least I've heard people, it's almost like, you know, if you know somebody, you can sort of get really quickly into a batch or on a list and so forth. Um, how are we going to get this out to these communities quicker? The president today talked about strategies to try to get the vaccine out to, you know, other states that may not have had them as well. How, how are we going to get these out to these communities as quickly and make sure those disparities aren't existing? I would be happy. I just want to follow on one little piece that uh, Dr. Purnell mentioned, which is very sure. important, and that is that in a do the science uh, being decades old, good as she has described. Let's also remember that the review process was also very thorough and that there are African-American physicians who are on the committees 
that are reviewing these vaccines. It is very, very important. So those meetings that are happening right now at the FDA, there are two African-Americans at least who are leaders on that team. And so we have our people who are trusted voices on that. The, the issue with getting doses to the black community will mean that number one, we've got to learn how to help our seniors and our people navigate the internet connectivities and be able to participate in the registration process more effectively. The reason that we are seeing privileged people jumping the line is because they are very good or they've been better at having better internet connectivity and better skills at being able to quote, play the game. That's unfortunate. We're gonna to have to help each other uh, being able to do that. So internet connectivity problems uh, are gonna be critical and we'll need to help overcome those. Meanwhile, I'm very encouraged by the Biden-Harris administration's interest in community-based organizations as a mechanism of following up. We know that the CBOs, the faith-based organizations are standing uh, ready to do their role in either being direct sites to be able to provide the vaccine or to be able to facilitate uh, connectivity for their members, their parishioners, their congregations with other sites. And that's gonna be a big part of it. I'm also finally encouraged that the Biden-Harris administration looks to be sending dollars and money to support community-based organizations in, in implementing either of those two pathways. But at the end of the day, we're going to need to have a community-based response that marries together with other strategies. You raised a very interesting point when you talked about people of color being in the process. Um, many people might wonder too, were, were people of color included in the testing? Um, you know, was it sort of, was that taken into consideration? I can weigh in. In on fact, this. it is true. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Dr. Purnell and then Dr. Tuxin, go ahead. Sure. Um, I just was getting ready to say I participated in a Moderna COVID-19 um, vaccine trial. And I think it's very important for black and brown communities to hear that we were represented in the process to arrive at a solution, right? We had a heroic role in helping this nation to be able to beat back this pandemic. If you look at the statistics that have been released around diversity in the Moderna and the Pfizer trials, we had roughly 10% participation of blacks or African-Americans in both of those trials. We had anywhere from 20% to 26% of Latinx or Hispanics in these trials and roughly about 5% agents. And it's very important as we talk about undoing and destroying inequities that this is one inequity that we counteract and that is adequate and inclusive representation of diverse populations in the clinical research process. Because this allows us to say whether or not data is generalizable, and it also allows us to speak from a more trusted position and place. So I think it's gonna be very important as we emphasize the Dr. Kismikia Corbett and the others who are having a role in the, the advisory panels that we also emphasize the roles that everyday Americans, black and brown Americans played in having us to arrive at this point. Yeah, we heard a lot I'm about so Dr. Kizzy early were... on on this. Go ahead, Dr. Tuxin. Yeah. No, I'm just saying I was so glad that, that that she went first because I think she nailed it exactly. The only other alternative uh, 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 augmentation I want to make is that the Black Coalition Against COVID is comprised of the four historically Black medical schools, the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association. And what is important is that those institutions have also been a part of the process of doing the clinical trials so that we have been engaged. Black scientists, black uh, uh, academic leaders, black institutions have been a part of this. And it is very important to understand that people with the kinds of pre-existing conditions that the black community experiences, whether it is hypertension, uh, uh, cancers, heart disease, people with sickle cell disease, people with Im immunocompromising disorders, all of those were included sufficiently in these clinical trials for us to be able to make assertions with confidence that these vaccines are not only effective in our community, but that they are also safe. And that's very critical when you talk about pre-existing conditions because we do know a lot of people have them. Dr. Webb, we hear every day about a new variant, uh, the concerns about an, a much more powerful, virulent um, a strain of the coronavirus. Talk to us a little bit about what you know about these variants and kind of educate people, if you would, please, please because every day there's some, some talk about, in New York, 
city, for instance, talk about the variant here. So Dr. Webb, talk to us a little bit about that and what the concerns are, and are we keeping up with that with these vaccines? Absolutely. Well, I'll start off by saying, Dr. Tuxin, by leading off and talking about the uh, the variants, that was that was spot on. We have to pay close attention to these. It's one of the realities of this kind of virus is that it changes over time. That's the way that viruses survive. And in fact, when there's more virus circulating, when there are more cases, there's more spread of the virus. It creates more opportunities for these copying errors in the virus itself that create these variants, these mutations, if you will. And so because of that, we have to do a couple of things. We have to stick to those core public health messages of wearing a mask, physical distancing, hand washing, you know, following those rules, and then also taking the vaccine when it's your turn. If we can stop the virus from spreading, we're decreasing the number of opportunities to create really dangerous variants. The variants that we have right now, we are paying uh, close attention to. Certainly, I mean, folks have heard of these uh, being described by the countries where they were discovered, the UK variant or, or the South Africa or the Brazil okay. variants. But the, the truth of the matter is variants are all over the world in different measures. Here in the United States, we do keep track to some extent. We do some surveillance and we are increasing the amount of surveillance that we're doing because it's important for us to know what's circulating in our communities. You mentioned in New York just today, the conversations about variants there. And so far what we're seeing is that some of these variants do spread a little more easily because of the change they make uh, in some instances to that spike protein on, on the coronavirus. And so these are things we have to pay close attention to, not just their spread, but also how effective our vaccines and I don't want to just talk about vaccines because there's also other therapeutics as well. Monoclonal antibodies that have been shown to be effective. And those are, are other tools that we have in our tool belt to fight against this, this pandemic. And so we have to keep track of how effective our therapeutics and our vaccines are against the new variants that are cropping up. And, and I would say from a perspective, we talk about it every single day, but we have to stay really vigilant on that. Right, we absolutely do. By the way, folks out there are probably um, ha having their own questions that they want to ask you, and I'm going to open it up to questions in a bit. So if you do have questions, make sure you um, dial uh, star three, and we will get your questions in here. And I think we're going to turn to you all for uh, questions in just a second. But really quickly, uh, Dr. Tuxin, you talked about not, uh, not letting our guard down. Um, well, somebody asked me today, so if I got the vaccine, do I still need to wear a mask, and why do I? So what do you say to that? Yes, you do need to still wear your mask. And the reason you need to wear your mask is because well, we do not know yet that the, that the vaccine uh, will keep you from spreading uh, a disease, the COVID uh, virus, to other people. And so we want you to be very careful. You still are protected from becoming significantly ill or dying, as Dr. Webb has said, but you still have the ability, we think, to be able to uh, transmit this virus to other people. And so we want you to be just as cautious as you have always been, being a responsible, ethical, moral human being, someone who loves human beings, who loves life, their own and that of others. And that means that even after being vaccinated, you have to be careful so that you do not become someone who will inadvertently sicken another person or cause them to die. This is a sincere, serious moral obligation until we get to the herd immunity and stop having any more fuel for this pandemic fire to burn. Once we get rid of all the fuel, all the logs are no longer available for the bonfire to burn, then we'll be able to take those masks off. Well, even the Queen of England today mentioned that uh, we should think about other people more than we think about ourselves. She sort of went out on a limb and actually urged people to not only get the vaccine, but to be careful with that. I think we may have our very first question from um, the audience um, available. So. Shall we open it up for yes. questions uh, to you? Yes, uh, Deborah, we have Perlene in Battle Creek, Michigan. Perlene, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. I was, my question is, I have signed up for the shot, but I'm wondering, do you have to stop any medication or vitamins before you take this shot? Um, either Good one question, of you can Andy. take some. Yeah. Sure. Um, Don't stop uh, your Dr. medications. 
Sure. Don't stop your medications. You're able to stay on your routine meds uh, and as well as your supplements before you take the, the vaccine shot. The one thing I do want to make sure everyone is aware of, you should not pre-medicate with an ibuprofen or a Tylenol, something of that nature, so that it doesn't diminish potentially the effectiveness of the body's response to the shot. But you can take your medicines and you should take your medicines before getting vaccinated. So what you're getting at is because many people report a sore arm. So you're saying don't try to take something to mitigate that. Just take your vaccine no. and see what happens after the fact. You can take something after, right? After being inoculated, but don't take something before being inoculated. Okay, very, very good. Next question. Well, and just really quickly, I, I wanted to add. Oh, so hold on one second. Oh. Dr. Webb wants to add something, please, if you would. Yeah. I I think I completely agree. I think um, these are the kind of things where if, if you do have a doctor, make sure you talk to your, your physician when you have these sorts of questions. If you don't have a doctor, definitely, you know, try to try to get connected and, and ask because these are really important questions. People want to know with their personal situations how this is affected. And I know for all of us, we probably do a lot of these uh, engagement events. And so I always tell people, you know, if you do have, uh, you know, a, a primary care doctor or a doctor who you can see regularly, you check in with them. But by and large, I mean, that advice is absolutely right. And so your questions are never bad questions about your medications. You may want it personalized a little bit more. And, and that's a good opportunity to talk to your provider. Very good advice. Next question. Yeah, we have Francine in the Bronx. Francine Graham, go Hi. ahead with your question. Hi, good night. I want to thank all the panelists. You've been very helpful in sharing information, and I'm very grateful. But my question is, what are the implications for women who have not yet had kids, and even for women who have already had kids, because honestly, it's a concern for everyone. Um, what are the implications of the vaccine since it came up within a year, right? So obviously, I'm not sure how much testing was, was done on pregnant women, if any was done. So what are your thoughts on that? Dr. Thompson? We are still saying that, and the, the evidence is that even people who are women and pregnant are still able to take this vaccine. And one of the things that you should be very clear about is that, uh, as Dr. Webb and others have talked about, this mRNA vaccine uh, that enables the body to work so well to produce, a sensitive, produce antibodies that can go after the spike program, uh, protein, all of this is being done outside of the cell nucleus. The vaccine does not penetrate into your cell nucleus where your DNA is. So we want you to be very well aware that this vaccine does not pose any risk uh, to altering the genetic structure of the human being. And that might be a big reason, uh, a concern that many pregnant women or women thinking of becoming pregnant might have. Can I ask that something? That is a very, very critical well? question. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Just like your point to that, that's very very critical and excellent point for us to be able to make sure the public understands but there were women in the trials and there were women who became pregnant right you are screened and haven't been a participant your checks are ensure that you aren't pregnant but there are people who became pregnant incidentally okay so we have that amount of data in addition to that we do have drug companies, Pfizer in particular, that are beginning to do trials in pregnant women specifically. So when the recommendations came forth, what the CDC and then other specialty professional organizations like ACOG, um, obstetricians and gynecologists have said, there is no evidence to date that suggests that the vaccine should be contraindicated in pregnant women or breastfeeding women, but that this is a choice and a decision that a pregnant woman should make with her physician, right? And the reason why it's important for pregnant women to consider this vaccination is because we know when pregnant women are exposed and become infected from coronavirus, their incidence of severe outcomes is actually higher. So once again, this is a risk benefit scenario, a risk benefit equation. And so it, it was very encouraging for me as a public health physician and talking with the public that there wasn't a blanket contraindication, but saying, yes, pregnant women can consider getting vaccinated um, and that they should discuss this with their physicians. And do they pass along some protection to um, their fetus? Dr. Purnell? 
do they pass along any protection to the baby? Um, not that not that I'm aware of um, specifically, right? But I, I don't know any science or data that has looked at that. Just sort of curious because I. I mean that is. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying nor do I. It's a it's a great question, but no, I don't think we have the data on that. We still don't know yet. Well, we we are getting the facts, but um, we also have a video that is going a message that is going to talk to us a little bit more too about not only just the facts, but getting us back to some of the things that we miss. So let's take a look. COVID-19 has changed how we show up and show out with our family. Now it's time to take the first step that lets us get back to talking smack with the side of mac and cheese. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts. As COVID-19 vaccines become available, you may have questions. Should I get it? Is it safe? Should I wait? It's smart to question. Now, get the facts at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Very, very important because there is that group. I mean, there's the diehard folks who absolutely want to go get their vaccination. And then there are a number of people who are either hesitant or, you know, absolutely reluctant. So hopefully we can answer a lot of these questions tonight. Um, let me ask you guys uh, another question, though, and uh, any one of you can take this who who would like to, but we were talking about, you know, wearing the masks and so forth and going forward. Um, the president was saying today that he hopes to get another 50 million people vaccinated, um, you know, in the next month and a half or so. But as we approach the summer, uh, does anybody, and maybe Dr. Webb, you want to take this because you are working very closely with the White House, do we think that we might start approaching a level of some kind of, if, if this happens, I mean, the big question is, can we get to 50 million more people? And there are clearly millions more to, to get to after this. Will we see the summer starting to approach some normalcy or do we still have to wait and see what's happening with these variants and so forth? I was waiting for the crystal ball conversation. I think <laughs> this is a question I get, I get literally every single day. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, if we take, Dr. Purnell, and we move her all over the country and get her to talk to everybody, there's a good chance we can. If we get good information <laughs> out to folks and we really show what the science tells us, what the facts are, if we speak to people in a way that connects with them, and then if we remind them that those health practices we've been talking about for so long, that really is our, our best approach. If we do all those things, we're going to get through this faster. If we don't do those things, then we will see ongoing spikes. We will see variants emerge. And so it's really important to keep in mind. I always, I always use the parallel of, of boxing. It's like protect yourself at all times, right? And anytime you're in the ring, and the ring is the world right now, protect yourself at all times. That can be with those basic public health measures or it can be with the vaccine. But whatever it is, understand that until we're through this, you have to be ever vigilant. And we need great public health messengers like Dr. Purnell and Dr. Tuxin and others to, to continue to get this message out to, to get it done. You're absolutely right. right. We could just get Dr. Purnell going all over the country. She's gonna convince everybody. You're absolutely right. Dr. Tuxin, let me right. ask you a question that, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Purnell. No, I was just gonna say, I always say get safe and stay safe. Right. We want to emphasize to people that this is not just one action is just not vaccination. Then you're done, um, because I think that leads to that question about when can I take my mask off? But if you think about it, about get safe and stay safe, I think that helps the public to understand we have to get a critical mass of us, not just across the line, but stay safe once we are across the line. But let me just drill down a little bit more on the mask question, because I think a lot of people still don't really understand that if you get the vaccination, they're wondering, and someone asked me this today, why should, why do you still have to wear a mask? Does that mean it's not completely effective or what is it protecting you against at that point? And um, I so, don't know, Dr. Whoever. Yeah. So what, what, again, remember that what this vaccine is doing, it is keeping you from once infected by this virus, it is keeping you from becoming extremely ill or dying. Mm. We are still studying the clinical work and we're studying this every day to find out whether or not it is actually also stopping the ability to spread the virus from one person to another. Because that data is not yet as clear as we need it to be, we are still operating with the premise that what it's fundamentally doing is protecting you from becoming significantly ill or dying. We are hopeful that it will show impact on stopping the spread from one human being to another. But until we get to that place, 
we're asking you to continue to wear your mask. Okay, very nice. Yeah, well sorry. Uh, I would just add, go ahead. The stakes, Dr. Webb, the stakes are too high, right? The stakes are way too high. You know, from what we know, we already have half a million people who have died from this pandemic. And so the, the truth is, if there's a that you can continue to shed virus even after being vaccinated, and right now we don't have data to suggest that it's impossible to shed virus, well, then there's a chance you could get somebody else infected. And if they get infected, they could become really sick. They could die. The stakes are too high. We think about the opportunity cost or the relative cost of wearing a mask and protecting the people around you versus not. We just think that right now, based on where the science is, it's just that much more important to, yes, you're protected from severe illness and from death. But while you're at it, protect the people around you. That's how we keep our communities uh, strong and vibrant and moving forward through this pandemic is by looking out for each other. Dr. Purnell, and that's about one the, way, I was just going to add one point to that. It's important to say that's one way the Johnson and Johnson vaccine candidate is distinguishing itself, right? So if you look at the data that has been released so far, there is suggestion through the endpoints that they studied that there could be additional protection against asymptomatic spread, right? Mm. So if we're able to conclusively say with this J&J one dose, while it's 85% effective against preventing severe disease and death or hospitalization, it is likewise effective at preventing asymptomatic spread. That is going to be another powerful tool in our toolkit. And the data is suggestive of that, perhaps even over 70% effective at preventing asymptomatic spread. Which is really, really key because, you know, I mean, obviously we don't always know who's who's got it. Um, what about people who are, you know, not just, you know, elderly as in 65 and older who have been getting the shot, but those who are like in their 90s. I spoke with someone today who said she's almost afraid to have her 90 plus year old father and mother um, get the vaccine because she's worried that there could be a little additional risk there for them. And she doesn't want to have to carry that worry. What about people who are in their 90s closing closer to 100? I still encourage those who are 90 and above to get vaccinated because, again, it's that risk benefit equation that we're discussing. If a 90 year old gets exposed and gets infected with coronavirus, the ability of their body to fight the infection and to survive it is less high than if someone younger and doesn't have a host of comorbid conditions. So because of that risk, someone that is older should get vaccinated. You will take the precautions, right? You'll have that necessary dis discussion with your physician, practice shared decision making, but still you should get vaccinated. And in the trials, when we had older persons who participated, the vaccines were shown to be equally safe and were shown to be equally effective. Dr. Tuxin, you're nodding your head there. Very important, very important. And it comes back again, and we've used this term several times tonight, and it's important to remember the risk benefit ratio. Remember, Dr. Webb just reminded us of how many people have already died, you know, well over 500,000, and we're headed to 600,000 before very long. And, it's, and where, who are the people experiencing so many of those deaths? There are people who are older and those who are over 90. And so it is a much better chance that you have of, be, of, of being protected from the vaccine, which we again know is safe and effective from the risk of having the disease and having that be the thing that kills you. It's a very easy calculation for most of us to make. And we hope that those of you who have family members or in that age group will take the time and sit down carefully with your family and have that conversation with your loved one. And keep in mind the risk of being unprotected and dying from this disease versus the risk, which is so minimal, of having secondary complications or issues from taking the vaccine itself. Look, I lost my 78 year old. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I lost my 78 year old father to this pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that personal mm -hmm. experience of losing my father at the height of the surge when the epicenter was in New York and New Jersey. And I tell people the epicenter of this thing landed on me. Not only did I lose my 78 year old father, I lost cousins younger than that, 59 in their 60s. And my sister, a breast cancer survivor, is a COVID-19 long hauler. I wish I had the opportunity to use my dad as a, as, as a case scenario to say, hey, get your elderly parents vaccinated. But because I 
I don't have my parents with me now. I've been vigilant about their siblings who remain alive. And, you know, my 82 year old um, aunt, twin aunts have been vaccinated. My uncles have been vaccinated because it is that important of a choice and a decision, especially in black and brown communities where we have been disproportionately devastated by this pandemic. Deborah, I would also just want to add to this point, which is really, again, I think so, again, important. We have always, as people of color, been family. We are about our families, and we're about family survival. For all of our Latina ex-brothers and sisters who are listening, about family. And so for those of us who are young and are not yet eligible for the vaccine, it is your opportunity to get involved now by helping your your parents who are eligible, grandparents who are eligible, to be able to get vaccinated. This is a family affair. And so I would really hope and pray that that the kind of, of, of passionate message that we just heard, uh, that that will mobilize each and every one of us to engage in these family conversations, and not only in the conversations, but in driving an elderly family member to the vaccination site. Uh, being able to to download the information and the facts at places like blackdoctor.org, uh, a great website for information. Go and get that information and then share it with your loved ones. You don't want to be in a situation where you are crying later and saying, I wish I had, I should have, if only I had another opportunity. Well, this is the moment. What are we waiting for? That's a very, very good admonition because though that is one of the big hurdles too, because sometimes these elderly folks are not um, um, schooled in how to actually get access. Um, I understand that folks out there have lots of questions, so I'm gonna turn it over to you to get back to um, some of the questions that you have for the doctors. So go ahead. Hey Deborah, we have uh, Ty um, who says, I work in management and childcare and part-time in healthcare services. What are some of the pointers on handling conversations with those who may be a little more anxious about getting the vaccine? So just well, try I'm to talk sorry. to people without lecturing to them. Give us some, uh, some tips on how to maybe convince people without beating them over the head. Yeah, that's Dr. it, Purnell? it starts with listening. I saw, I saw Dr. Purnell was, was leaning into it. So I'm gonna pass it back to the public health expert here. But, but the truth is I, I had this conversation in the barbershop just the other day, you know, getting, getting a fade and somebody said, so how do you feel about this, this uh, vaccine? And I think that the conversation started with, how do you feel about the vaccine? What are your thoughts? What are you concerned about? And validating those very real concerns when people say, I don't know that it's safe. It's like, I can understand why you would say that. I don't know, I can understand. Are you that we have a history and a legacy of mistreatment going back to the the slave health deficit right we look very far in the history of black people in america to know that there have been times where we've been given a raw deal but this is one of those instances where we can walk through systematically every single point as to why that's not the case here why we've been at the table we've been involved we've been engaged and here are the numbers and i always say you know my mama brenda webb took that shot there is no way that that was going to happen <laughs> without having vetted it very extensively and, and usually when i say that people are just like you let your mama get the shot and then we're having a real conversation <laughs> you know so so i think that you know I, again it, it all starts with validating where people are coming from where they are and their concerns hearing them and then responding yeah dr Purnell. it's the power of story it's the power of storytelling and I really need people to understand that, right, these public narratives, these public conversations that we need to be able to escalate and then to pull into those very intimate settings. But people are on a decision journey. I tell people, I'm not here to convince you, but I'm here to walk with you hand in hand along this decision journey, right? Whether you are at the awareness phase, whether you're at the motivation phase, whether you're at the intention phase, whether you're at the action phase or the follow through phase. If we can have a story about that risk to benefit equation, if you can understand that black and brown folks are up to three times more likely to be hospitalized, black and brown folks two times more likely to die, if you understand that about a third of people who get infected with coronavirus are left with symptoms like my sister, a breast cancer survivor, and if you could understand that black and brown folks, we have higher exposure rates because of the jobs that we have and because of the housing conditions that we live in, and you add up all of those risks and you 
think about what the perceived risks are from a vaccine, the two don't add up. So I tell people, I want you to get safe and I want you to stay safe. And that's practicing cultural humility. That's meeting the person where they are and having an understanding of the historical injustices, right? An understanding that enslaved black women were used for experimentation by a doctor, understanding the Henrietta Lacks, understanding the Dr. Susan Moores and saying, I hear you, I get it, but this is the science and this is how the science has not been tampered with. And this is why I need you to get safe and stay safe. I think we can each have that conversation and we can have it in the barbershop, we could have it through virtual meetings a church service, we could have it in a community center, or we could have it with a family member, but we need to be able to tell stories. And right? Deborah, or I the beauty shop, go even, for that matter. Her. And I like the cultural yeah. humility. I like the cultural humility. Dr. Tuxton, go ahead. No, 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 I'm glad. No, the, the, the one thing that's very important is African Americans are, we are not homogeneous people. We are heterogeneous. Right. The approaches right. and the and the issues in terms of how we approach these issues has a lot to do with our age, uh, our, our personal circumstances, and so forth. And so I think it is very clear that we, as we've heard, we need to listen, but know that we are not monolithic. And so our stories are unique. I think it is very important that this uh, question from our, from our questioner is working with young people in the school systems and so forth. And so let's remember, of all of the communities that have the most at stake for getting our kids back to school, it's African Americans. Those we are the ones that need to get our kids back into school, and that won't happen until we get this disease under control, or at least it won't happen safely. So, if you care about our young people, you have to care about all the public health initiatives, and you have to care about getting uh, vaccinated. That is very clear. And I think as we continue to think about the legacy of the past, and that's come up several times. Let's remember that all of us who are legitimately outraged by historical insults, such as the Tuskegee experiment, remember this, what those, those people were experimented on were denied access to the drug that would have saved them from their disease. They were denied to the drug that would have saved them from their disease. It makes no sense to be, his, to be angry and, and furious about Tuskegee and then deny yourself the access to the drug that would save your life. You've got to use That's common very, sense as we go forward. Very important point. And also your point about children too and, and kids in school, because a lot of studies have shown that kids are suffering uh, in large ways too, emotionally and, and, and you know mentally and in so many ways to not being um, in the school building. So we know that that is a major part of all of this as well. Um, next question. Deborah, by the way, I want to speak one little quick thing in, and, and that is also to the answer to that question. I think we should pay attention to the Ad Council uh, 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 commercial that you ran and think about the theme that they used as well. This is one of the very important themes, which is if you want to get back your life, then this is also important. And that is an important theme that they, uh, they have promoted mm -hmm. for us. And I think we should pay good attention to it. I think you're absolutely right. And hopefully we'll be seeing more of that ad campaign too as we go forward, because it's all about giving us hope. Um, next question, because I guess we're gonna start running down on time pretty soon. Another question? Yeah, we have Betty Calhoun in Florida. Betty, go ahead with your question. Betty? We may have lost her. Okay, let's go to um, Samara. And for one second, Samara in uh, New York. Hi, I hi, I'm 60 years old. I got irritable bowel syndrome. I got a uh, bipolar disorder with psychotic episode. I got fibromyalgia. I got asthma. I got uh, allergies, and I don't know if I can get the show, the injection now. So she's saying she has a, a number of underlying conditions, as I'm sure you probably heard. Which one of you would like to take that question? Sure, I'll weigh in. So um, we've said this multiple times tonight, so I'll leave with this. This is definitely a conversation you want to have with your physician. Um, I've said I've used this term before shared decision making where you and your provider talk about 
what are the benefits to you being vaccinated, and also talk about are there any contraindications. What we do know, the vaccine is only contraindicated, meaning you should not receive the vaccine if you have allergies to any of the ingredients, in particular in the mRNA vaccines that have already been approved through emergency use authorization. In addition to having known allergies to any of the ingredients, if you have an allergic response, an immediate allergic response, whether that is very severe, which is very rare, or whether that is milder, you should not get the second dose. If you have a history of allergies to other vaccines or even injectables, what the CDC is recommending is precaution, right? So this is a scenario where you say I have allergies, I would have more questions for you. What types of allergies do you have? Do you have food allergies? There is not a contraindication to those with food allergies receiving the vaccine. Um, I've had two family members who have shellfish allergies who have received the vaccine. You are observed for a longer amount of time and then you're allowed to you know, exit the vaccination center. Um, again, only if you have known allergies to ingredients in the vaccine and that's a conversation that would be best had with a physician or if you have an immediate allergic response to the first dose, is it a firm no? Otherwise, there are other considerations that would need to be made with your physician. So you would have to share that information. Your physician could tell you what's in the vaccine rather than us trying to break that yeah. down right here. Your physician yeah, would be able I mean, to tell you what's in the vaccine that you're getting. It's publicly available, but yes, you can, I would prefer someone to have that type of conversation with a healthcare provider, right? So in the mRNA vaccine, just for those who are interested, because I get asked this question a lot, um, you know, it is the mRNA or the genetic recipe, as people have described, the genetic instructions, the genetic blueprint. Um, it's fat, so uh, a polyethylene glycol, which helps to hold the mRNA together because it, it's very unstable. It's salts and it's sugars. There aren't eggs in the, in the vaccine. That's a frequent question I also get asked. But yes, you can have that level of detail discussed with a provider. Very quickly, before we get to our next question, Dr. Webb, I'm going to put you on the spot again. Do you think um, within the very near future, as in the next couple of weeks, we'll have three vaccines in our in our um, toolkit then, and that will give us a better opportunity to get people? I mean, you know, we know this Johnson & Johnson is, you know, in the queue and, and, and likely to be approved. Do you think we're going to have these three available in the next few weeks? That's the hope. If it's safe and if it's effective, then the answer is yes. And that's what the FDA is going to be weighing in on. But remember, the, the goal was always to have lots of different candidate vaccines. You want to be able to, to know which ones kind of rise to the top, which ones are going to be the most effective for which groups. If somebody for some reason can't take one of the vaccines, then you have other options. And that's why I think from the federal perspective, they were at the same time developing mRNA vaccines, adenovirus, uh, viral vector vaccines, right? Different groups of vaccines so that there were a couple of different candidates to, to work from. So, so yeah, the hope is that we continue to have diversity in our portfolio. We have options for people um, depending on what their you know, potential limitations are in terms of what they can get. But, um, but we'll, we'll hear more from the FDA very soon. Okay. All right. Um, I am, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, Deborah, there's a, there's a question. Um, people want to know what are the options for people who don't have health care? For, for Dr. Webb. So those who don't have health care, there's a big, a big concern, and there, that clearly is the case for a lot of people, particularly over this last year, who may be out of jobs, who may have lost insurance. Um, Dr. Tuxin, do you want to jump at that, or which one of you all want to talk about that? I think Dr. Webb would love to be able to make the point on behalf of the Biden administration that this is free. But please, Dr. Webb, I don't want to take that from you, my brother. <laughs> I appreciate the Ali, my brother. I appreciate it. So, I mean, honestly, this has been one of the focal points is making sure that this is within reach for everybody in this country. This virus doesn't care about your insurance status. It doesn't care about what state you live in. It doesn't care about your immigration status. What it cares about is that you are a human being that can pass this virus on to more people. And so we need to make sure that every single person in this country can get access to this vaccine. And so the administration has been very clear on that. No cost, to the, and this is something that isn't just a Biden administration policy. The Trump administration knew the same thing. This had to be no cost to individuals. And I think now what we're saying is beyond it being at no cost to you, you have to have places where you can get it. So not just saying uh, it's gonna be at your doctor's office. No, it has to be in easy to reach places. We have to have more venues for vaccine. Dr. Tuxin mentioned 
partnering with community-based organizations. Those are the kind of ideas that we're really looking into. How do we get vaccine to people? So beyond it being uh, affordable for you, no cost, uh, not worrying about the insurance dynamic, it also has to be accessible to you as well. And that's where we're spending a lot of time and energy complementing what the states and localities are doing to say, what federal programs can we bring? We have our mass vaccination sites, which are good for some folks. We have a retail pharmacy program, which is getting it to trusted locations because pharmacists are some of the most trusted individuals in a lot of our communities, both chain and independent pharmacies. And then also our federally qualified health centers or community health centers, making sure that we're increasing the amount of vaccine that they have, because that's a trusted provider to both the insured and the uninsured in a lot of instances. And so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, but you know, we're always going to keep looking for more and more options to get this vaccine to everybody uh, so that we can protect everybody. So again, right, just to be um, sure that nobody misunderstands, the, the cost of the drug is free. The administration of the drug is free. Don't anybody let anybody charge you money for this. You can get it done. My, price is not an obstacle. Money is not an obstacle. Very important point. One last question before we have to wrap up tonight. Yeah, we have Michael in uh, Mansfield, Texas. Michael, go ahead with your question. Hey, good evening, panel. Good evening. I got uh, one question today, and it has two parts. The v first question is, I've already received my first and second dose. How long is, am I going to be protected with that first and second dose? Will I be required a later on in the year to get a booster shot, or will I have to come back and do this regimen all over again next year? But y'all brought up a point. My second part of that question is y'all brought up a point about me and my wife been going back and forth. I was under the understanding that the vaccination shot would help me not get COVID vaccine. I mean, not get the virus. Is he, are you telling me that I can still get the virus, but it is designed to keep me out of the hospital and, and, and keep me from getting really, really sick? Or does it do both? Very good question. I can start with that. So for the two part question, um, the first part, no one knows the answer to that yet, right? The science is still evolving. We have data that's suggestive how long the immunity from the vaccinations will last, but no one can say that conclusively. Will this be an annual injection? Will you need a booster because of the variants? Those are things that drug companies are presently examining. I can tell you, we are almost coming up on a year of those who participated in early phase trials, especially of the mRNA vaccines that have already been approved. And like someone myself, I've been vaccinated since August and October, participating in the trial. And then to the second point about whether or not the vaccines prevent infection versus whether or not the vaccines prevent symptomatic disease. What the endpoint of the studies were, mainly in Pfizer and Moderna to date, because those are the ones that have been approved here, they weren't looking specifically to say, hey, does it prevent asymptomatic infection? They were looking to prove that it prevents any type of symptomatic disease, whether that's mild, moderate, or severe. And we know that these vaccines are very effective at preventing a disease and especially effective at preventing severe disease. There is data within the trials that are suggestive that even the mRNA vaccines can prevent transmission of asymptomatic infection, meaning you have coronavirus, but you have no symptoms. You don't have any signs of illness or sickness. But where Johnson & Johnson's trial distinguishes itself, and especially because it is a later trial, right? And this data is still coming out. I've been closely watching and following for this, and we'll hear about this definitively over the next two days. Johnson & Johnson asked that question or attempted to get an answer for that question. Does this vaccine prevent asymptomatic infection? And so far, the data is very suggestive that it does prevent transmission of coronavirus, even if you don't have active disease. So say you didn't get Johnson & Johnson, should you be concerned? You should be um, very reassured by the fact that you won't get sick, you won't need to get hospitalized, and the chance of you dying is zero. What you would want to know is, can I spread it to a loved one or another person? I can't say that definitively, especially without knowing if you got Moderna or Pfizer. Um, but I can say we will know more. So stay tuned. And until we know more definitively, please continue to wear your mask. 
wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, and all that good advice that we have had. Um, this has been so, so uh, helpful to me personally. I know to so many people out there because, uh, you know, the, the science is changing. We are learning so much more and, and also just hearing so much more every day. So Drs. Uh, uh, Chris Brunel, Dr. Cameron Webb, Dr. Reed Tuxen, we cannot thank you enough for your um, advice and your plain spoken language tonight. I think you helped so many people. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here with us. And I guess, President Johnson, I will turn it back over to you. Good. Thank you, Deborah Roberts. And I want to thank all of our panelists. This was an outstanding conversation tonight. The chat box is lit up with comments of how excellent you all were with the information, plain spoken. I love the comment that the barbershop is a Black American think tank, being culturally uh, sensitive, all of the things that's necessary for us to navigate through this moment of a pandemic. I feel really good. Uh, today it was announced that over 50 million uh, vaccines were distributed across the country in the backdrop of over 500,000 deaths. But I think we are going in the right direction finally. You know, a nation that's confronted with a global pandemic without a federal response, now we have a federal response and experts like the panelists who we heard this evening. NAACP with our partner with the Ad Council and many other partners, the Divine Nine and so many others, we're gonna do all we can to ensure the information get to each and every one of you so that you can understand your options. We're not here to promote anything other than there are options so we can save lives, save our community, save our families. So until next time, I wanna thank all of our participants who joined us this evening, our host, Deborah Roberts. It was it's an honor to have you join us and all of our listeners, those of you who joined us tonight and those of you who will be listening to the rebroadcast of this, the NAACP, it is our job to ensure that we improve the quality of life of our members, our communities, and to make democracy work for all. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful, wonderful, pleasant evening.